Yeah, welcome to the last session of FSE. It will be a session about new designs and there will be three talks. The first talk is Ariantum, Length Preserving Encryption for Entry-Level Processes by Paul Crowley and Eric Biggers, and Paul will give the talk. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I uh, want to talk about uh, a problem. <coughs> I'm on the uh, Android platform security team, uh, and I want to talk about a problem myself and my colleague Eric faced, uh, and what we did about it. Um, this is going to be one of the, the less technical talks. You know, it's the last day, we're all tired. Uh, but also, Adiantum is not a sort of deep technical advance. Uh, it's a combination of well understood techniques, and what I want to talk about is the, the practical problem that we faced. Uh, and uh, why we chose uh, Adiantum as a way of solving it. <coughs> so, um, if you, any of you who have uh, Android devices uh, in this room, uh, undoubtedly those devices will be encrypted. Uh, and those devices will have uh, something like uh, ARM uh, cryptographic extensions, or perhaps even an inline crypto engine that makes AES super fast. Um, and so those devices will be encrypted using AES. Um, but <clears throat> for a lot of devices not in this room, devices being, for example, being used in developing countries uh, or IoT devices or something like that, um, they have processors like the Cortex-A7 processor which lack the uh, AES CE extensions. And on those devices, AES is just not an acceptable performance. And so this affects uh, storage encryption, which is my area, but it affects all sorts of things like, for example, TLS connections. And in TLS, uh, the uh, solution to this was RFC 7539, uh, which uses uh, Dan Bernstein's primitives, uh, Cha Cha Poly 1305, uh, to build a fairly uh, straightforward AEAD mode uh, that you can use for, for these kinds of applications. And it is, I don't, I'm afraid I don't have benchmarks, but they're similar to the benchmarks I'll show later for Adiantum. This is way faster uh, than AES on these devices, and that gives users an acceptable performance. And so for an internet connection, for network connections, uh, RFC 7539 solves this problem. <coughs> Trouble is, uh, because it's an AEAD mode, the ciphertext has to be larger than the plain text. Uh, there has to be room for a Mac and there has to be uh, a nonce which is not reused. For storage encryption, we have to have a ciphertext which is the same size as the plain text. Uh, and I'll, I'll get onto why that is. So you're probably, the, the most familiar example of storage encryption is uh, the full disk encryption. For every physical sector on the device, we have a virtual sector, and uh, the, a, a read, a write to the virtual sector, um, which is, has to be exactly four kilobytes because that's what the software expects, is encrypted and is uh, sent to the hardware as exactly four kilobytes because that's what the hardware supports. If we had flash storage that gave us a little bit more room, if we ha could have a few extra bytes uh, in our sectors, then we could use an AAD mode to store these extra bytes. That would, that would change uh, the picture there a little bit. I've been saying this since about 2000. Uh, I've been having this conversation with, like, if the storage manufacturers could just give us a bit of extra room here, we could really do something different. Um, even if they were to turn around tomorrow and say, okay, we're going to do it, it would take a long time uh, for that hardware to become available. And to me, this problem is urgent. There are <coughs> devices out there that are not using encryption because we don't have a solution to this. Now, on a lot of um, more recent Android devices, we don't use full disk encryption we use file-based encryption. And at first, I hoped that this would give us another way to address the problem. It would allow us to, um, uh, that the file-based encryption could mean we could have a bit more flexibility in our uh, format, and maybe we could make room for a little bit of extra st uh, storage for a nonce and a Mac. Sadly, it doesn't really work that way. Uh, first of all, that would be a major engineering effort by itself, to write a file system that could make room for this. It would be a, a, a pretty deep change. Uh, but even uh, given those deep changes, there would be certain circumstances where you would see a major hit. So databases, for example, they expect that if they have a multi-gigabyte database file, they can go to some four kilobyte line sector, make a change, and see a single write. If we have to update a nonce and a Mac for that sector, making it a little bit larger, that means it's got to be at least two writes. And when they read from it, at least two reads. Um, <coughs> that halves the speed. 
it breaks atomicity, makes it much, it's a major challenge uh, to update this in a way that is atomic. Uh, but worse than that, it's really bad for the flash devices. The lifetime of a flash device is measured in writes. Uh, <clears throat> if under these circumstances we're doubling the number of writes, it will halve the lifetime of the flash device, which would be a, a serious inconvenience for users. So even in the file-based encryption scenario, we can't get away from this problem that we have to have the ciphertext the same size as the plain text. In order to call itself an Android device, uh, a device has to pass what we call the, the compatibility definition document. And that for many years now, uh, the CDD has required that Android devices be encrypted. But there's a carve out. And there's a carve out so that people in uh, developing world countries can have a, a, a full fledged uh, smartphone uh, operating system uh, on the hardware that people there can afford. Um, <coughs> that carve out says that if you encrypt uh, AES at below 50 megabytes a second, you may ship an unencrypted device. Now, that's, that's sad in that lots of people have unencrypted uh, devices, but it also provides some pretty weird incentives. If you can just slow down AES in your device to 49 megabytes a second, bingo, you can ship that device unencrypted, and now your device is faster than the device that runs at 51 megabytes a second, which is unencrypted. So I, w I was pretty unsatisfied with this, and I, uh, I, I wanted to fix it. <coughs> so here's what we did. So given that the uh, ciphertext has to be the same size as the plain text, we can't achieve the formal properties of an AEAD mode. It has to be deterministic because it's a bijection. Uh, we rewrite new content to old sectors, so there's no way to store a, uh, an, an, a nonce that isn't reused. And the best we can achieve is a tweakable super pseudorandom permutation. Uh, we want, for every sector, uh, we want there to be uh, a, a bijection between the plaintext and the ciphertext, which is indistinguishable from a random permutation. And for all of those uh, sectors, we wanted to be a family of random, uh, a family of permutations that's indistinguishable from a family of random permutations. And that's assuming the attacker has access to the uh, encryption and decryption functions. <coughs> so an example of a tweakable super pseudo random permutation is AES-XTS. And this is what we use on modern file-based encrypted devices. Um, to encrypt a four kilobyte sector, we simply apply AES XTS 256 times in parallel units. And so the tweak comes in two parts. There's a part for the offset into the sector, and there's a part within the sector, for the offset within the sector. However, on the devices we target, we see performance of around uh, uh, 59 cycles per byte, uh, which is like 20 megasecond, which is way too slow uh, for our user's experience. If they're loading an app or something, it takes really visibly too long, uh, and so we, we can't um, expect that. Our users won't accept it. <coughs> better than, we can achieve a better security guarantee if our uh, super pseudo random permutation is applied to the entire four kilobyte sector. So a change to any bit of the plain text in that sector affects the entire ciphertext and vice versa. And for every tweak, it should appear to be a, an, a completely new permutation. Not only does this give us better security properties, it gives us an opportunity to be faster. Because we're operating in uh, much larger bulk on the data, we can use uh, primitives that work in bulk and uh, give us greater speed in bulk. <coughs> An SPRP has to read every byte of the plain text before they write anything. And so you have to have at least two passes. Because we want it to be super pseudo random, uh, we need the same property in the direct decryption direction, which means a minimum of three passes. Um, so we've gone for a hash saw hash structure simply because the hash is faster than the saw. And so doubling up the hash is, is uh, faster than doubling the saw up. Uh, and we're inspired by examples like, I mean, there's, there's a, a, a lot of interesting work in this area, which is cited in the paper. Uh, we're inspired by examples like uh, HCounter and HCH, um, which that you know, like the other work that, that we looked at um, is based on the assumption that you're going to use AES and you're going to use uh, multipliers in GF128. Um, Hcounter and HCH have this, this hash saw hash structure. Uh, they have a um, narrow 16-byte uh, block on the left, uh, and they use that. They hash the wide block on the right to uh, combine with the block on the left. They use that to generate uh, the nonce that goes into the counter mode encryption, uh, and then they hash again on the other side. 
um, and there's a single block cipher call on the, uh, the thin block on the left uh, to defeat the uh, Luby Rakoff attack on the three round Feistel structure. Um, but because, like the other things I looked at, this is based on AES and GF, uh, GF2 to the 128, um, it doesn't perform acceptable, it achieves better security properties, but it doesn't perform better on our hardware. <coughs> so the work we did was simply to take these ideas in HCANTER and HGH and combine them with the ideas from RFC 7539 uh, with the like, high performance primitives we have. Um, and so um, we, that means we changed the, uh, the hash combiner on the uh, left to uh, addition uh, mod 2 to the 128 because that's the combiner that works well with our hash. Um, and, but the, the structure is, is basically very similar. Um, we also, because Chachar is very well behaved compared to AES and counter mode, uh, we can achieve a slight optimization where we don't have to, uh, um, what's the phrase I'm looking for? We can achieve a slight optimization where Chachar and AES can run in parallel in the decryption direction so that we sacrifice the symmetry of encryption and decryption, but it can give us an opportunity for a slight speed up in decryption. And so that, give, that gives us a, a massive performance boost, 17.8 cycles per byte, well over twice as fast as AES XTS. Uh, and that, that was a big win. Um, but we needed it to be, if we were going to, the, the discussion we were going to have with OEMs, trying to make sure this feature was mandatory, was going to be a lot easier for every cycle per byte I could shave off this mode. Uh, so the first change we made was we switched from ChaCha 20 to ChaCha 12. Um, the, currently, the best attacks on ChaCha uh, break seven rounds, and that's been the case for over a decade now. And it's seen a lot of cryptanalysis in that time. So every round of cha-cha adds a lot of strength. Um, and so we, we felt good about uh, uh, choosing, choosing that mode. Um, that gave us 13.6 cycles per byte, which is a significant improvement. Uh, but there was room for one other improvement, uh, which is that while Poly1305 is very fast, there are still faster uh, epsilon almost delta universal functions on, uh, on this hardware. And so we looked at NH uh, for hashing the bulk of, of the data. Um, NH is blindingly fast, around 1.5 cycles per byte. NH's output is variable length. Uh, the, uh, the, long, the, the more you hash, the larger, larger its output. So we use NH essentially as a, as a compression function um, to reduce the amount of data we feed to poly1305. And then poly1305 handles the final hashing stage. Uh, and that's then combined, combined with the tweak. Um, and that g gives us our mode adiantum at 10.6 cycles per byte. And so this is the, uh, the overall performance um, where, uh, mo so because, the, uh, because of the single AES encryption, uh, we get faster the wider the block we're encrypting. But we're still fairly acceptable even on the um, 512 uh, byte sectors that you used to get on old devices. Um, and we're, we're faster than, uh, not only are we faster than AES, we're faster than other block ciphers such as uh, Noikion and Spec. And there's a, there's a larger uh, performance table in the paper. Um, I think I've got time to uh, talk a little bit about the proof. Um, it's, uh, it's fairly straightforward. Um, so this is, this is the main step in the proof where the adversary is trying to distinguish between uh, two worlds, world X and world Y. Uh, they can make plain text and ciphertext queries of any length and tweak. Um, so, so world X is essentially adiantum, except we replace the block cipher AES with a random permutation pi, and we replace cha cha with a, a random function f. In world Y, for every query the attacker makes, they get a random reply of the appropriate length. Uh, and we're going to use the uh, H coefficient technique, um, which is thanks to one of my reviewers for pointing that, out, uh, suggesting that. Um, and so after the final query, we're going to make the attacker's life a little bit easier. We're going to give them the hash key, which can't hurt and can only help them. Um, <coughs> once the attacker has the hash key, um, one thing they can do is calculate all of the intermediate hashes inside uh, Adiantum. Um, so you've got this, this diagram where you've got the, these hashes being either side of AES. And uh, we're going to allow the, the attacker to calculate those. Um, so they can put in the plain text at the top, tweak at the side, and get the plain text hash, and the same thing for the ciphertext at the other end. Um, d having done that, they can look for collisions 
either in the plain text hash or the ciphertext hash. It doesn't matter if a plain text hash collides with the ciphertext hash. It only matters that if there's a collision in a specific layer. Um, and <coughs> the, uh, if they find such a collision, they're going, they're going to win. What's the probability? For whatever queries they do, uh, we can bound the probability of finding such a collision. And because the, the, the wonderful thing about the H coefficient technique is we only have to consider the probability in world Y. Uh, this, is, this is the uh, effort that it saves us. So the, for the result, it's pretty simple. The result is totally random. So the right-hand side is totally random. And it's combined with whatever the hash value is, but the result is totally random. So the probability of collide with any specific previous query is 2 to the minus 128. For the, uh, this is assuming a plain text query. It's all the exact opposite for a ciphertext query. Um, for a plain text query, uh, the, it's <coughs> the epsilon, we rely on the epsilon almost or universal property of the hash function. Um, the, we forbid pointless queries. Um, so given it's plain text query, either the plain text or the tweak or both must, for any given previous query, they have to, one of those two has to be different. And so the re result is the probability that the hash will differ by any given amount is at most epsilon, meaning the probability there'll be a collision in uh, the plain text is at most epsilon. Um, <coughs> and so across all pairs of queries, um, the, the probability that we'll see uh, such a collision is at most epsilon plus 2 to the minus 1 to 8 uh, times Q choose 2. If that happens, we call that a bad transcript. And <coughs> so supposing we get a good transcript. What's the probability, given the queries the attacker, uh, <coughs> for a, a given deterministic attacker, what's the probability we'll see a particular set of responses? Um, in world Y, it's pretty simple. For a given response, the probability is 2 to the minus p. All responses are equally likely. The length of the response is uh, the length of p, uh, and so 2 to the minus the length of p. In world X, it's almost the same. We'll see a particular response, first of all, if f has exactly the correct output, to zor into the uh, content on the left-hand side to convert it to the uh, expected content in the ciphertext. The probability of that is 2 to the minus the length of p minus 1 to 8. On the right-hand side, pi has to encrypt in just the right way. For the first query, the probability of that is 2 to the minus 1 to 8. As the queries go on, because this is a, a good transcript, it's always producing a value that it's never produced before, and it's always guaranteed to produce a value it's never produced before. And so the, its uh, probability of getting it right uh, goes up by a tiny bit every time. Uh, and so that's 1 over 2 to the 1 to 8 minus i, where i is the number of queries before this one. Um, and oh, I should mention that the reason why we can say, uh, make the assertion I did about f is because the nonce that's being fed to f is unique every time. And so its output is always independent from all previous outputs. Uh, and these two probabilities are also independent. So overall, the probability we'll see this, um, well, it's, it's this formula here, it's the product of the two. But the important thing is, this is always either the same, depending if it's one query, or just a little bit bigger than, world in probab than the probability in world Y. And these uh, sum across all queries. So now we can apply the H coefficient technique. Every good transcript is at least as likely in world X as world Y. We've bounded the probability of a bad transcript, uh, and that bound, uh, it bounds the distinguishing advantage, which is at most epsilon plus 2 to the minus 1 to 8 uh, times uh, Q choose 2. So epsilon depends on the some bound on the length of the message and the tweak the attacker sends. We're using polynomial hashing, so uh, the longer the message gets, the longer the tweak gets, the, uh, the, the, the larger epsilon gets. Um, but we, we plug that into our formula, and we add terms for uh, PR, PRP, PRF uh, bound, and for um, to char and AES. And we get this uh, rather large expression. But the uh, key thing is that it is uh, linear in the message and tweak length, and it's quadratic in the number of queries, and it's small. Okay. <coughs> uh, the good news is Adiantum is. Uh, already part of Linux 5.0. Um, so I, I don't really uh, think in terms of years. I, I, I don't call years 2017 and 2018. I call years things like Oreo and Pi uh, because those are the names of the uh, Android dessert releases that come out in each year. So this year's release was Android Pi, 
Um, and we have added uh, and add the Anthem to Android Pie, and some devices will be using that. Um, and in Android Q, which we don't know what it'll be called yet, if you know of a dessert with, uh, that's called after the letter Q, please let me know. <laughs> um, the, uh, there will be no carve out. We will require encryption on all devices, and where AES is too slow, those devices will use Adiantum. Thank you very much. Any questions from the audience? So oh, then I will ask a question. I was wondering, so you said it has uh, some favorable properties compared to XTS. Mm. So could it be also interesting to use it on the devices which have AES support and then replace the cha-cha call with AES in counter mode or something? Is that something you looked at or? Um, where you're using sort of like AESC instructions, that's very appealing. Uh, a lot of these devices, so a lot of these devices have inline encryption engines and there it's hard to make changes, but also an SPRP mode is a terrible fit for an inline encryption engine. They want to be able to stream the data past, oops, excuse me, they want to be able to stream the data past and decrypt it as it goes. Uh, and an SPRP mode totally rules that out. You have to read everything before you get to write anything. Um, and so maybe that's possible, but I think that will be um, that will take a little bit longer to to land. Okay. And maybe another question I was interested. Uh, just maybe could you give some ballpark figures, like how many percent of Android devices um, this would be deployed in the I next don't, year? I, I know. I know it's uh, many millions. Uh, but I, I think I'm not allowed to say. Okay. Uh, I think that sort of thing is super So we take this question offline? <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's a lot. I mean, you know, it's the next billion users we're aiming this at. It's a lot of people. Mm. Okay. Then any questions from the audience? Then let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>